man, I am so excited to watch the finale of Critical Role Campaign 2. It's coming up soon. I just need to get through 360 hours of content. <sighs> I'll be there eventually. In my old D&D group, the main DM of the group, he was the main DM as he had the most experience, who I had talked about previously was a big fan of Critical Role. So was I. And I started with the first campaign, while my DM started with the second campaign. And when I finally got to the second campaign, I immediately started to see similarities to the old campaign I played with the DM. Now, I'm not trying to say that you can't have things similar to other people, because that's how a lot of DMs get their inspiration from other people, but it certainly didn't feel like a coincidence. To me, based on how highly the DM would speak about Critical Role whenever he wanted us to make our characters similar to the characters on that show, so he didn't really seem to care about originality. I'm starting on episode 5 of Campaign 2, and so far I've spotted a couple of similarities. Firstly, the first plot hook of Critical Role is almost the exact same as our first plot hook, with a mysterious force creating undead and the party being placed under investigation and forced to find the true culprit to clear their name, which, once again, I wouldn't have thought my DM copied if not for the fact that it was this specific DM. The second similarity lies within the character Fjord of Critical Role, who on episode 4 or 5 was visited by their patron, who has ties to water as far as I know, in their mind while they slept, and then woke up drenched in water as well as coughing water up from their mouth. The exact thing happened to our water-themed warlock, Fathomless, which isn't what it was called at the time. In my group's campaign, which would be fine about that kind of thing normally, because that's a really cool detail, but for some reason, the player who played the Warlock didn't select the subclass, the DM did. I don't know why my DM wants things to be so similar when he could have just swapped things around, but that just seems like a trend with him. He was almost passive-aggressive when I said my half-orc skin color was gray, by saying that gray skin is pretty weird and that green skin was more popular. He told me that's what Fjord looks like, and I'm like, Dude, I know that. Speaking of my half-orc, he was a zealot barbarian who worshipped a god of war, and aimed to gain the god's blessing by proving himself in battle over and over. However, because he is dumb as a bag of rocks, fails to understand the god's principles, and follows the reasoning that battle equals good, and believes that his god thinks violence is absolute. Because of this, he won't be able to gain a blessing until he changes his way of thinking and grows as a person, but because of his awakened zealot powers, he believes he has already received a blessing, and his way of thinking is further ingrained into him, driving him to become a bloodthirsty psycho until he gets some sense into him. Not that it mattered what I wanted him to become as I left the group after the DM tried to gaslight me. God, I want to play this character again. Why is this important? Well, my DM was constantly trying to pressure me into letting my barbarian become a champion of his god right off the bat, and still tried to get me to give in after the campaign started. I tried to explain to him that gaining his god's blessing so early would defeat the entire purpose of the character and his arc, and what I wanted to roleplay as, but after that, he only made passive-aggressive remarks about it. I just realized that he just wanted to have a divine being interact with me like a cleric or a warlock would, which makes me think that he just wanted my character to be a cheap ripoff of Yasha, which would fit his theme, but I'm not too certain at this time. My DM would also often make fun of the other less experienced players when we talked in person, and would bash their actions, the campaigns they ran, and even advertise for his campaign to me by stating that at least it wasn't run by those players. They were new players, we can't compare them to experts. They are still learning the game and how to act in TTRPGs in general. He became a little toxic. A little, anyway. And this was when I first started to realize that he wasn't as kind as he used to be, or portrayed himself to be. The thing is, however, that I believe I was partially responsible for my DM's toxic awakening, for lack of a better term. I enabled him. Back then, I was kind of a dick, and whenever I got mad at the other players for stupid reasons, I would complain to my DM. Eventually, I started to make fun of them because they had fun differently than me. I was a great A asshole. I think this made my DM more comfortable with doing it. They saw me as someone who wouldn't judge them for bashing their own friends. 
I think my DM took it a bit far. He seemed to be full of mirth when he was making fun of his friends behind their backs. He was doing it to make himself feel good. I think I was doing it because I was angry with no outlets. I started to feel guilty about making fun of my friends, and I stopped giving that sort of feedback. That didn't stop him though, he kept going and I kept quiet. I never really stood up to him about it, and the only time I did was when he eventually tried to get my friends to get mad at me because I didn't think that one of his encounters was fair. And then he told one of my friends that I had been talking about them behind their back. I don't hang out with these guys much anymore, they weren't really my people anyways. Kind of ironic, isn't it? Me being an asshole inspired my DM to become an asshole, which led to him exposing my douchey actions when I decided I didn't want to be a jerk anymore. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed hearing me be a curmudgeon and complaining about my DM. At least the complaining is anonymous this time. I'll ask any questions if I can. Thank you for reading. Man, there's a lot to unpack here. For starters, the critical role effect on Dungeons and Dragons. We've actually talked about this before in another video, but if you aren't Matt Mercer, you damn well should not expect your players to be Sam Regal and the other way around. Look, Critical Role works for a lot of different reasons. The friendship between the players, the professional voice acting, the setup, the budget, an awesome DM with a lot of time to create an amazing story, the friendship between the players, again, huge deal. I've talked about all of this before on my channel in a different video, but there is a lot going on with Critical Role and expecting that your game can be like that right off the bat is completely unreasonable. If Critical Role is your ideal D&D game and you want to strive for that, I think that that is okay. I think that there are way too many people who think that Critical Role is like the worst way to play D&D and that it completely breaks the game and has completely ruined it and having voice acting and trying to roleplay and all that is just complete crap and it shouldn't be part of the game. Basically, play your game the way you want. If you want to emulate Critical Role, that's great, but don't be like this DM and try to pressure players into playing exactly the same story. I don't really understand the point of that. That doesn't really just fall into critical role, that's just general D&D. You don't want to rip off a story, at least in my opinion, completely because this game is all about creating your own story, which is why I'm always confused when people want to play the exact same tale that's already been done. Having your own twist on it, now that's interesting. But doing the exact same thing, with the exact same characters, exact same plot hooks, that does confuse me. I think you're doing yourself a massive disservice if you do that, because creativity is half the fun of this game, if not most of the fun of this game. But anyway, next story. I found a GM offering a D&D game for new players, and I found a character sheet of a dwarf lumberjack, because apparently dwarves hate trees, handed to me without any backstory. After a few sessions, we all created backstories for our characters, however, the DM mentioned some adjustments had to be made to my backstory because my character had previously been to the town we were heading to, and that we would discuss the details later. The GM explained the town is run by different insurance companies, which we later found out were essentially triads. The Yellow Insurance owns a lumber mill, and my character used to be a former employee before he left and became an adventurer. However, he still has very fond memories of the mill and the employer. By the way, we later figured out that the head of the Yellow Insurance is called Mr. Ling, and he has an Almost almond-shaped eyes and a yellowish complexion. Oh, that's nice. Casual racism. So far, so good, I thought. Until the following dialogue came up. But just so you know, the lumber mill is heavily guarded and the employees actually weren't able to leave the compound. So I was a prisoner? I don't think the character would have fond memories of being a prisoner. The GM responds with, you were no prisoner, you obviously were allowed to leave, theoretically, but everyone who did was severely punished. And he noticed I wasn't convinced. Plus, you were also paid very well, so you still have good memories. So, dwarves love their gold, I guess? Well, but since you weren't able to leave, you had to spend everything on the insurance-owned store on the compound and everything there was insanely overpriced. So I couldn't afford anything, and I wasn't allowed to leave without permission. 
I still don't see how the character would think kindly of the time. At this point, the DM is getting slightly annoyed. No, no, you think very highly of the lumber mill. After all, every year they would throw Christmas parties for the employees. And free beer once a year made my character forget he was basically a slave? Well, actually, only one beer for free. The rest was bought with employees' money at the store. That makes it even less likely that any dwarf would give up their freedom for one free beer a year. Yes, but you still have good memories, because they later promoted you and you were allowed to work outside of the mill to acquire the wood. So I got a pay raise and could leave the compound. No, you, you didn't get raised, just a different position, and they were actually following you around all this time to make sure you went straight to the wood and went back to the compound after finishing your work. At this point, I just gave up and said, well, at least he could be outside in the woods, I guess, doing what he loved, killing trees. The GM responds with, Yes, exactly, and when you tried to leave after 15 years, they actually let you go, even though no one has been allowed to leave before, and you were very grateful for that. So, you still have very good memories of your employer. They kept all your gold, though. The story later unfolded with us being pressured into working for the triad and the DM basically wanted to give my character a reason to cooperate with them because of all the fond memories, but still make them seem very cruel at the same time. It obviously resulted in an absolute dumpster fire, but that is a tale for another thread. I need to see this other thread, where is it? Okay, look, point is, this is another thing where the DM didn't properly plan out what he was thinking and came up with some BS excuse rather than just admitting that he messed up and needs to fix things. At least, that's how I see this. If that is the case, there is a very practical lesson to be learned here. Guys, don't be afraid to admit when you are wrong as a DM. Don't be afraid to say, hey, look, I didn't think of this and I need to rethink this over. That is okay, your players will forgive you. They're not the unforgiving editors of a book publisher. They're D&D players. If your players are nice and fun and are your friends, they will forgive you for making mistakes. This DM did the opposite of that. Instead of trying to fix the mistake, they just doubled down and created a dumpster fire of a mess that just completely messed up a player's character and basically made them have Stockholm Syndrome. That is not good. When you're wrong, just admit you're wrong and try to fix the mistake, rather than doubling down and creating a confusing mess. Alright, next story. Occasionally, I run a Monster of the Week style beginner's game, just some basic adventures with whoever shows up. These games are aimed at newbies to show them the ropes and, of course, recruit them into some of my other games. Since there's a lot of younger players, I keep things PG-13. I don't mind the occasional veteran player joining as well, as long as they're fine with sitting back while I tend to the younglings, or helping out themselves. Now, get a hold of these two guys and how I kick them out. The cast is me, the DM, Edgelord, an older newbie player, I suspect he wasn't new, just got kicked out too often, Elitist, a veteran player and RP Elitist, absolutely full of himself, and some newbies that didn't say much and you'll understand why. My other table rules for these games are simple. No evil characters, only PG-13, and cooperate. Edgelord was immediately confused by my no evil PCs route. For a newbie, he had suspiciously familiar arguments against it. Evil characters can be great storytelling devices and stuff like that. That's too complicated in a casual group with newbies. This game is meant to be as simple as possible, I told him so, and I still disallowed it. The elitist immediately jumped on that discussion with further arguments. How I, as a DM, can't interfere with player agency, blah 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 blah, I shut that down too. This is a tutorial group for newbies, for crying out loud. Want to make a storytelling epic about your edgy character? Find a different table. These guys sulked, but it was pretty clear I wasn't budging, so they decided to agree and leave it. Quest of the day was a bandit camp that got too dangerous to be handled for the town's guards because someone with magic appeared to be helping the bandits. The group moved out, dealt with some crazy druid, and arrested the rest of the bandits all nice, clean, PG-13 action. Edgelord 
wasn't having it though. Before the guardsman arrived to lock away the bandit, he took a female bandit aside for questioning. Oh. But instead of asking a question, something like this came out. Edgelord. I want to cut all the tendons in her limbs and make her crawl and squirm on the floor with her useless limbs. The table was shocked. Emergency Banhammer was ready. I argued that it's pretty high on the scale of sadism, especially for this game, and I'm taking the character over as evil NPC, following the rule that evil characters are not allowed. Elitist immediately jumped to defend his buddy. At first, they tried to make a case how the bandit's life is inconsequential and it shouldn't matter in any way what happens to them. I think it says a lot about their mindset, if that's how you go to defend your deeds. That second point was that the bandits were executed anyway. Yeah, this isn't getting any better. The sad thing is, they seem to believe this overall as an acceptable mindset. I wasn't going to listen to any more of their BS, and I'm not entertaining anyone's murder boner. Banhammer was deployed for both. These guys are human garbage. I mean, I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, look, there's a group out there for everyone, but don't force people to endure some weird murder crap that you get off on. I mean, look, you do you in the privacy of your own weird games and homes, but in other people's games where that clearly is not allowed, don't do that. Don't force your crap on other people. I mean, I think everyone understands that. Well, clearly not everyone, but most decent people understand that. I don't really know what else to say. Well, okay, if that's all I've got, then that's all I've got. If you guys enjoyed this episode of RPG Horror Stories, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more episodes of this series, as well as my other content, then please do subscribe to Crispy's Tavern. And finally, if you want to leave your own thoughts or stories, go down to the comments down below. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. It's one in the morning. I'm going to go to bed. Until next time, farewell.